born from the ashes of World War I. This car company made some of the most beautiful cars I have ever seen in my entire life. I'm not talking about Lamborghini, I'm not talking about Picani, and I'm not talking to Mercedes. The company was called Spiker. This car company survived many challenges and full stops before things started to come together for them. The Spiker company started in 1880 as a Dutch carriage company at first. In 1898, they built a Benz engine motor car, which won high praise for the bodywork. It was absolutely glamorous and stylish for its time. Then in 1901, Spiker entered a car in the Tour de Netherland, basically a tour of Netherland. Instead of starting with the rest of the field in this four day, 556 kilometer long race, they started two days later and won the race in just 23 hours. They just smoked everybody. In 1907, a Spiker 1418 PK entered into the most grueling race of all time, the Peking to Paris race. Back then, roads were really horse trails. But six months later in August, the Spiker finished second in the 15,000 kilometer monster race. Everybody was shocked. Where was the car? Where did this car come, come from? How, how did they get here? That story is coming up right after the break. Have you ever Googled your name? If you have, you were probably shocked to see some of your personal information floating around for the whole world to see. Every once in a while, I Google myself just for fun. I'm always surprised what kind of things are floating around the internet. It's just creepy that these companies have this information on me. So this is what they do. These data brokers are making money hand over fist by selling your info to robocallers, spammers, and in some cases, much worse. This is why I'm talking about today's sponsor, Aura. Aura can identify data brokers who are exposing your information and then submit opt-out requests on your behalf. Brokers are legally required to remove your info if you ask them to, but they make it super hard to do that. So let Aura handle all of it for you. Now you can get off of all of those lists. You can try Aura free for two weeks using my link here below, aura.com slash Craig. Aura does so much more to protect you and your family from online threats to do can't even see. It's really easy to set up so you don't have to bother downloading several different apps just to get things like parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft, insurance, and even more. You get everything at one affordable price. So let Aura do all the hard work of keeping you safe online so you can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. Over the next seven years, Spiker continued to develop cars for racing and had lots of success. But with World War I, they then turned their attention to building aircrafts. They produced 100 Spiker V1 fighter airplanes and 200 aircraft engines as spares, which is a great testament for the two blacksmiths who started the company building horse-drawn carriages. After the war, they went back to producing cars. Unfortunately, despite producing some amazing race cars like the Spiker 3040 PK and setting a few amazing records, by 1925, the company had had to shut its doors. Then came World War II in the late 1930s. There was no history about that. Then in the 1950s, and it seemed that we'd heard the last of this amazing company. They didn't come back after the war. We didn't hear anything about Spiker. <laughs> In the year 2000, 75 years after the original company dissolved, it was resurrected. And on October 17th of that year, Spiker Cars unveiled the Spiker C8 Spider at the Birmingham Motor Show. Everybody was drooling on that car. It was just something new, unique, and just sexy. The following year, the world got a look at the new C8 Laviolet at the Amsterdam Motor Show, but they weren't done yet. At the Frankfurt Motor Show in the same year, Spiker debuted the C8 R. It was glorious, fantastic, and, and even sexier than the C8. This was a hand-built aluminum sports car, developed predominantly for endurance racing in the LM GTN FII class. Remarkably, the car only did two races, being the 12 hours of Sebring in the first part of 2003, and then in the 24 hour of Le Mans in the same year. So they were serious and they were coming up. They had a lot of momentum and everything was great. Also in 2002, they released the street version of that car, dubbed the C8 12 S, S for street. So they make it street version of the race car. With growing 
growing momentum and overwhelming praise from automotive journalists, Spiker made a public offering of stocks in May of 2004. Now, the problem with going public, if you know what I'm talking about, going public means that you have to answer to shareholders, which means that you need to get your product to market quickly. You have to be efficient. You have to sell many units consistently. And most importantly, they have to be profitable. That's a hard thing to do with any company, even some of the manufacturers going on right now, right? At the time though, the United States economy had mostly rebounded from the dot-com bubble. And we were in a period of people refinancing their houses and spending the cheap money on boats, exotic cars, and other things that they couldn't really afford. And then of course, the, the economy fell apart five years later. People at the time were buying Ferraris, Lambos, and so forth, using home equity loans and all kind of stuff. And so while more people could afford higher market cars, it helped everybody, not just Spiker, but there was a bump and there was renewed interest. Meanwhile, Spiker motored on. In 2006, Spiker acquired the Midland Formula One team for a cool price of $106 million and competed in Formula One for the 2007 season, but it only lasted one season and the team was soon bought by Force India and that was the end of that. And so I don't know where they got the money, what they did with that money. And then in the same year, Spiker introduced the D12, which was renamed the D6, which was basically a super SUV way before the Lamborghini Urus. It was debuted at the Geneva International Motor Show. This SUV was inspired by Spiker's race from Peking to Paris 100 years earlier in 1907. It was, was kind of cool thing. And then in 2008, Victor Mueller became CEO of Spiker Cars. Together with Andrea Zagato, they unveiled the C12 Zagato concept at the 77th Geneva Motor Show. It was a hit as well, and this car was a beast. They horseshoed a six liter VW W12, making almost 500 horsepower into this car. Overkill for a light lightweight car, but it was magnificent. It would also be offered with an automatic transmission using paddles or a true manual six-speed. This thing was a, a, just a beast. Unfortunately, that car never made it to production, but a watered-down version called the C8 Aileron was shown at the 78th Geneva Motor Show in 2009. And this was about the time that I got introduced to Victor Mueller. Spiker is very bold. It's a daring product. It's not for everyone. Spiker is very pure. It's pure design, pure materials, pure craftsmanship, pure heritage. Beautiful racing and aviation heritage. And it's a very engaging car. If you drive a Spiker, it's something you'll definitely remember. It is not something like you've ever experienced. It's a very engaging product. It, it draws you in. He hired my team to make a promotional film for car shows. I got to know the man, I got to travel with them, I'd go do several events with him. So we went to Miller Motorsports Park near Salt Lake City to film automotive journalists putting the cars through the paces. Great event. We were there for something like five days, a lot of driving. This was my first good look at the C8 Laviolette and the C8 Aileron. I fell in love immediately with the Aileron. It was just a gorgeous car. It was sleek and it had, I mean, the, the styling cues were amazing. It was different from almost every other exotic car. Only Pagani had something remotely simpler to Spiker's design cues. Spiker styling was heavily influenced by their history in aviation. Everywhere you look, you can see propellers, ducts, vents, and other aviation influence touches and styling cues. It was an amazing car, both the C8 Laviolette and the C8 Aileron. These cars were hand built and they were light, very light. So while 400 horsepower wasn't super impressive at the time, you have to consider the weight of the car. Both of those cars, and they were light, they were nimble and very analog. And it didn't matter that these cars weren't the fastest exotics on the road. These cars blended performance and style without being vulgar. And like I said, for this exterior, most of the exterior trim was basically raw aluminum. The wheel spokes look like the propeller from Spiker's World War I fighter plane. And you see many more styling cues just like that. You get in there and take a look at the gauges. The switch gear is very positive, right? It was fantastic. When you threw the switch, you know what you're doing. Inside, it was part race car, part art. The gauges resembled the face of some Breitling watches, and I love Breitling watches, so it was a definite turn on for me. The pedal box was something that you would only see in professional race cars like Formula Fords and any other professional racing cars. The cars were set up for true heel and toe driving, and the Audi's V8 with its lightweight flyway made the car a blast to drive when you nailed the heel and toe shift. The 
exposed shift and linkage was likewise something you would only see in, in formula cars or dedicated race cars with few exceptions, which is pretty cool. So when you get in that car, you know that this is a true driver's car. There was no ABS, there's no traction control. It had a manual steering rack. Basically, it was plush on the inside. I mean, they didn't have a radio or anything, but like I said, it was light, really light, about 2,800 pounds for the Laviolet and about 3,100 pounds for the Aileron. I drove both the C8 Laviola and the C8 Aileron. What fun cars they were to drive. <laughs> of course, the motor sounds fantastic. And at the time I had an Audi RS4, so the Spyker seemed somewhat familiar to me and I took to the car like a fish to water. So I really love the cars. Just sitting in the car was really cool. At some point, Victor Mueller was considering using the engine from the Cadillac CTSV, which was a 6.2 liter at the time. That motor produced about 550 horsepower, but it never happened for these cars. A lot of things started coming down the pike at that point, and it was getting difficult to proceed. Still, these were competent cars. It's no wonder they would take a shot at the 24 hours of Le Mans starting in 2001 to 2003. Then again in Sebring in 2002 and 2003. And then using the Spyker C8 Spider GT at the Nürburgring in the LMGT class. They also raced an FIA GT in Dubai in 2005. So they were doing the circuits for the first part of the decade and then things started to unravel. Around 2008, there was another housing crash and so cheap money dried up. They exotic car market took a hit, a significant hit, and a lot of people started selling their exotics. So it just got ugly for a while. Then in 2010, Spiker bought Saab for $74 million in cash and about 300 and something million in deferred shares. And I, when I heard this, I knew this, they would regret this decision because if you look at the history of Saab, Saab was never a popular car in the USA. During the Saab's life from 1986 to about 2011, only a total of 500,000 cars were sold. That's nothing. Most years, Chrysler sells more minivans. After Spiker bought into Saab, it was basically bankrupt. According to the Netherlands-based sports car manufacturer, GM basically sealed Saab's fate by sabotaging a deal with Chinese investors in order to prevent Saab from competing against the US firm in China, a fast-growing market for the car firm. There you go. When you go global, the cheapest wins. Trying to save Saab though, Spiker reached out to firms like BMW, Fiat, Hyundai, and even Tata Motors, but these discussions went nowhere and Saab went into bankruptcy as did GM. And that was the end of that. And there were bailouts and all that other kind of stuff. Everything got ugly and it was just trash. And that pretty much spelled the end for Spiker as well. Or did it? Then the bankruptcy was reverted in 2015 and Spiker said publicly that they would continue with production of sports cars. Ah. Okay, they got going a little bit, putting things together, putting the company back together. And then in 2021, it went bankrupt again because of the global impact of COVID. This, their just the timing was just horrible. Then in 2022, Spiker announced another comeback and was now backed by Russian investors. Oh, what can go wrong with that? <laughs> I think it's still going on. I haven't looked at the recent developments this year, but this investment group reached an agreement with Spiker to bring it back to life again. Early plans call for production of carbon fiber bodies in Russia, engineering teams in Germany, and final assembly back in the Netherlands, which Spiker called home for many years. So what's gonna happen? Not quite sure, but if all goes according to the ambitious plan, Spiker will once again build handmade sports cars and not just a single model. The investment group plans to bring the C8 Preliator to production alongside a Peking to Paris SUV and a, a car called the B6 Venetator. So maybe this company will survive and I really hope they do. I really like Victor Mueller. I spent a lot of time with him. He was a really, really good guy. But to date, they've only built a total of 300 cars total since its inception in the 2000s. If Spiker makes a successful comeback, it would really make me very happy. Not just because I love the cars, but I really like the people over there. Thanks for watching, everybody. Please remember to like this video video and subscribe. And if you have comments, place them below. I try to get to them for the first 24 or 48 hours, then I have to move on. So hit me right after the video. I will answer your, your questions or your comments or listen to your ideas. Thanks for watching everybody. We'll see you next time. Thanks.